This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Five years ago, the collapse of Lehman Brothers set off the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. Economist James Galbraith analyzes what we've learned since then. At a time when the gap between rich and poor is at a 100-year high, demographer Philip Longman finds a direct link between an American's income and his or her health. And Bill Press talks with Democratic National Committee Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. University of Texas economist James K. Galbraith says that five years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the economy is starting to slowly come around. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, James K. Galbraith holds the Lloyd M. Benson Jr. Chair of Government Business Relations at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a senior scholar with the Levy Economics Institute and chair of the board of Economists for Peace and Security, an international association of professional economists. James Galbraith, thanks very much for joining us again today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Always good to be with you. Thank you, and, and, and that's reciprocated, of course. You know, we're, we're coming up on the fifth anniversary of the Lehman Brothers collapse that triggered the near depression. What are some of the lessons that we ought to have learned since then, and what hasn't been done that should have been done, or maybe still can be done? Well, to begin with the second piece, uh, I think it's clear now that we missed a, uh, an opportunity in 2009 to restructure the financial sector, uh, cut it down to size, and uh, reduce its enormous uh, influence over American politics. Um, and so that's, that, I think, uh, is an opportunity which was lost. It may come around again politically, but it's, it's clearly not there at the moment. Um, in terms of what's happened in the last five years, the whole experience, I'm sure, comes as a great disappointment to, um, of course, to many, to the entire population of the United States, but also to the community of professional economists, which was uh, had an expectation that things would return to uh, the previously normal conditions, that we would have uh, a, a full economic recovery, a restoration of high employment, uh, and that well, these things should have been resolved by now. Clearly, they haven't been. Clearly, we have entered a period uh, where, uh, for reasons we do not fully understand, we are experiencing uh, slow growth uh, and v- very little gain of employment, uh, and certainly in relation to the growth of the population. Basically, the relation of employment to population has fallen uh, really a lot over the last 13 years since 2000 and has not, uh, is not showing any signs of, uh, of recovering. So we're in a different economic environment, and I think it's, it's the moment now is to think about exactly what that means for, uh, uh, you know, for, the, for the policy challenges that we face. Difficult to, to look at history and try and solve today's problems then, right? Uh, I mean, is it that much different? Statistics- Looking at statistics in a mechanical way is going to lead to all kinds of mistakes. I think that's clear. And one of the mistakes that was made was assuming that the economy had this natural resilience, which only needed a little help from stimulus package, say, in order to get us back to where we were. That seems to have been a fundamental error. Yeah. Now, Ben Bernanke, as is, is most know, or is leaving his post as chairman of the Fed by the end of the year, do you think he'll go down in history as someone who didn't see the recessionary train coming down the tracks or as someone who miraculously put it back on the rails? Well, there's a little bit of both. Uh, I don't think he put it back on the rails, but it's clear that in the public record, the Fed at least pretended not to see what was coming down the tracks. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, let's say, a fundamental blot and embarrassment on the record of the institution. It's clear that when the uh, ship 
was thinking the Fed bailed like hell uh, and put an enormous amount of uh, liquidity into the system. Uh, and it's also clear that that did not put the economy back on the tracks. It enabled institutions that might otherwise have collapsed uh, and had to be taken over, which probably would have been a good thing to survive. Uh, but it didn't give us the kind of recovery that, uh, uh, let's say, Bernanke's mentor, uh, Milton Friedman, might have thought would happen, that Bernanke himself might have thought, based on that experience, would happen. Uh, it just hasn't happened. So we've really experienced the limits of the power of the Federal Reserve to uh, offset the kind of in, uh, slump that we're in just by uh, buying up assets and, and uh, putting cash into the banking system. We're speaking with James Galbraith, uh, Lloyd M. Benson, Chair of Government Business Relations at the Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, are, are low interest rates artificially propping up the housing market and the stock market? And doesn't that create the danger of yet another recession? Um, well, I, I think what's happened in the stock market bears you know, a deeper examination. Is there anything wrong with having kept long interest rates low? No, it helps uh, uh, people who are uh, need are able to refinance their mortgages to do so. But people who are underwater on their mortgages can't do so. People who are on foreclo uh, facing foreclosure are not helped by this. Uh, people who have uh, savings that they were counting on living on the interest from can't aren't getting anything from it. So uh, it's a policy with, let's say, very limited uh, benefits and some significant costs. I'm not saying that they should have that there, that there's some there isn't some natural rate for the long term interest rate to which we should be expecting to return. That's another fallacy. Uh, but uh, again, it's a question of uh, placing too much hope in the central bank to resolve what are clearly much deeper issues uh, is a way of distracting ourselves from from what we really need to be talking about. Who who has the proper role? in managing, managing the economy in, in crisis conditions? A central bank like the Fed or an elected legislature like Congress? Well, I think first and foremost, the, the, the leadership has to come from the president uh, and his cabinet, uh, and that obviously with the advice and consent of Congress. Uh, and once one realizes that, you have to recognize that there are, again, a large number of structural questions. The bloated financial sector uh, which is essentially dysfunctional, not making and underwriting business loans in a uh, in the way that you know we were accustomed to. to uh, we sort of think of what that's what banks are for. Uh, commercial industrial loans haven't gone anywhere for five years. Uh, is one part of the problem. The fact that we have uh, very high and unstable, uncertain uh, energy prices is uh, a second part of the problem. The fact that we have a vast uh, environmental challenge that we have not met is a third part of the problem. Uh, the infrastructure deficit. And then we have, uh, is another one, and the fact that, uh, that we are fight constantly having to fight off attacks on the uh, core social insurance programs, uh, which are, I think, much more uh, responsible for the stabilization of, econ of the economy that has occurred than they've been getting credit for. I mean, the fact is Social Security is still there, Medicare is still there. Those things have protected a large part of the population from conditions that would have been much worse had they been privatized or replaced by vouchers or various schemes that uh, are constantly being uh, hatched against them. You know, you, as you mentioned, the, the, it has to kind of start at the top, you know, the president working with Congress and that kind of thing. But there's been a lot of obstruction on just about every issue that the president has has had to tangle with when it comes to Congress. So is is there failure in, in us getting things done because of that and, and therefore the legislation can't move forward that we need? Well, I, I think the you know, history will write of the Obama administration that it came in. On a, on a false premise uh, that somehow uh, this great conciliating figure would then uh, uh, arrive at bipartisan consensus on a range of issues. Uh, and the reality is, of course, that you have a, a Republican Party which is interested only in 
getting and holding power, not interested in making compromise as, uh, uh, as the second party in the country. Uh, and so the, 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 the president, uh, if he didn't realize this, uh, was uh, in the grip of an illusion. And uh, if he did realize it, uh, he was certainly uh, in projecting a pretense to the larger public. The fact of the matter is, is what the what the country needed was uh, a, a decisive victory of uh, progressive forces and a chance to, uh, in some sense, create a new set of institutions suitable to the to the period ahead. And we haven't had that, and we don't have uh, the leadership in the Democratic Party now to for that to be a real, realistic possibility anytime soon. One only hopes that uh, it will come sooner or later. Again, we're speaking with uh, James Galbraith, uh, Lloyd Benson Chair of Government Business Relations at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin. What's your outlook on legislative efforts to break up the big banks? Uh, well, I wouldn't uh, hold my breath. <laughs> I think what may happen uh, in the banking sector is, uh, I mean, a, a new. I think there's a significant risk of a new crisis at some point, which comes unmanageable uh, as a result of the instability of the situation in Europe. Uh, and when that happens, uh, we will see whether the, uh, all of the uh, promises that have been made under Dodd-Frank and, uh, and, and, and if, generally speaking by the political system, that there would never again be the kind of uh, blanket bailouts that we saw in 2008, 2009. We shall see whether those promises hold good and whether we're forced to an uh, a different uh, strategy, um, and I, I think that's going to be very. I mean, it's a very interesting uh, set of risks that are out there. Uh, but it's clear. It's clear to me that uh, if one looks around the world, the place where uh, the let's say the political economy is most unstable is in the is in the eurozone. It's a uh, it's, it's it's a very challenging situation. Certainly. Now, there's a growing movement by minimum wage, minimum wage workers to strike for a day at a time. Is that going to have any effect it, uh, on the economy? And, and what effect would a raise in the minimum wage have on the economy? Uh, well, to begin with, the second part of that, uh, uh, the effect of a minimum wage on the a minimum, a significantly higher minimum wage on the economy would be very positive. It would help low income workers stabilize their incomes and their their their, uh, their 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 expenditure stream it would support uh, a lot of small business activity, a lot of service activity. Some small businesses would be hit on their labor costs, but they'd make it back on the customers having more money coming through the door. Uh, it would repair a fair amount of the damage that's been done to uh, low-income workers by the uh, in the aftermath of the crisis. So I'm all in favor of it, and I think that what the fast food workers are doing is uh, of great importance because it takes an issue that basically has been something that you know a few of us have been talking about for months and months, and places it squarely in front of the public, which is by and large I think sympathetic. Um, understands that these workers are not paid enough and understands that their communities would be stronger if low-wage workers were doing better. So that's all, I think, uh, very much to the credit. Uh, and obviously, the, the fast food workers have a narrower objective. They want to simply, they want mainly to improve their own working conditions. And, uh, I hope they succeed, but they're also doing a public service, it seems to me. Okay. James Galbraith, we appreciate your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org. Look forward to speaking with you again soon. Uh, uh, me too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrat. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. 
It isn't just income inequality, but there's also a disparity in health based on where you live, how much you make, and on your race. Demographer and health expert Philip Longman explains in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Question. Is making higher education available to every American more important to our national interest than letting Wall Street profiteers make a few more billions of dollars each year? Answer. Of course. Yet, our political leaders, pushed by Wall Street lobbyists, have been making the opposite choice for years. As a result, Banksters have loaded students down with a mountain of high-interest loans, rising from just over $2 billion a decade ago to nearly a trillion last year. Worse, the financiers, either banks or government lenders, have become the gatekeepers of advanced education, shutting out thousands of young people wanting to get ahead but not able to hurdle the formidable financial barrier. This is enormously costly to America and completely unnecessary. The smart choice, as we learned from the GI Bill after World War II, would be to make college and professional training free. Universal access to higher education, i.e. free access, produces a very high return on the public's investment while also producing a widely shared prosperity and a broadly educated citizenry. Of course, an upfront investment in a smarter, more productive, more democratic civilization is pricey. So where do we get the money to do what America needs? Get it from where it went. Wall Street's super-rich speculators are now making millions of super-fast robotic financial transactions per second, generating trillions of dollars a year for them, but producing nothing of real value for us while distorting and endangering markets. This is Jim Hightower saying, put a tiny tax on each of those automated gambles by speculators and more than enough money will come into the public coffers to free up higher ed for all. For information, check out United States Students Association at www.usstudents.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Health expert Philip Longman has found that where you live and how much you make directly correlates to your health status. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Philip Longman, senior editor of the Washington Monthly, a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, and he teaches health care policy at Johns Hopkins University. Philip Longman, thanks for joining us again today. Great to be here. Now, you recently wrote an article asking the question, is inequality shortening your lifespan? And you seem to answer quite clearly that, in fact, it is. How is that so? Well, there's now overwhelming evidence from around the world um, that places that have large uh, disparities in income also have large disparities in health. So that's true whether you're talking about different countries or different states within the United States or even within particular counties' uh, workplaces. Um, It's a mysterious thing about why it happens, but there's no question at all that it does happen well from global all the way down to communities even yeah Yeah, individual workplaces Um, so what it appears to be related to is um, stress for lack of a better word that it is stressful to be at the bottom of a hierarchy Um, you know, bosses often talk about the burdens of command and how stressful it is to to be on top of a hierarchy, and no doubt it is sometimes, but what is actually more stressful is to be the cowering subordinates of people on top of hierarchies. Um, And so even when we adjust for the fact that uh, people of lower socioeconomic status um, tend to smoke more, for example, um, it turns out that if you smoke two packs a day, uh, and are on the top of some hierarchy, it's much less threatening to your health than if you're at the bottom of some hierarchy. 
Does race does does race play a role at all? Well, you know, as we all know, um, there's tremendous disparities um, between blacks and whites in the United States in, in life expectancy. Um, but when you look closely at that data, you see that what it really correlates to mostly is income. So, uh, for example, um, lower middle class whites, um, I'm sorry, lower middle class blacks live longer than white people in poverty. And as you go up the socioeconomic stat, uh, ladder, um, the differences between black and white largely disappear. Um, so it, it's also interesting that while we can all understand why poverty itself, extreme poverty, would be harmful to your health, after all we talk about poor health, um, it's also true that um, middle class people uh, don't live as long as upper middle class people, and upper middle class people don't live as long as rich people, even though everyone except the very poor has the basic necessities of life. Um, so we have this uh, what they call social gradi social gradation of disease. Um, very mysterious about why it works and, and how it happens. Uh, we do have some insights into the biochemistry of this, um, having to do with a steroid called cortisol that is produced um, when people are in situations of stress in which um, has been shown to elevate one's chances of diabetes and many other um, regrettable things. Um, it's interesting, and, and I guess this sort of explains, you know, when you see the side-by-side -side pictures of presidents, especially when they have a second term that comes up, as, as we have with, with uh, President Obama, they start seeing, you start seeing the side-by-side -side pictures of, this is what he looked like four years ago, this is what he looks like now, stress of the job, bringing on the gray hair and that kind of thing. This fits along the same, same lines? Well, of course, our president is, in some senses, on top of a hierarchy, right? Well, yeah, um, that's true. But, but, but the stress um, but of the job. You know, there's, there's real stress in that job, and obviously it, it wears you out. Um, but, you know, if we were look, to look at the typical Walmart worker, you know, how he or she looked 10 years ago versus how he, looked, he or she looks today, I think we'd see um, as much or more aging um, as a result. And the, and the life tables bear that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the presidents live longer on average than do Walmart workers. Well, here's something that's interesting. Why is it that, that whites are so much more likely than blacks to die of liver disease or to commit suicide? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a funny little uh, factoid. Um, but if you think about it, um, what do you have to do to die of liver disease? Um, probably you have to spend many decades of hard drinking. Um, what do you have to do to die of Alzheimer's disease? You know, you have to live to be at least 60 or 70 years old. And <clears throat> because whites are much more likely than blacks to live to be 60 or 70 years old, they're much more likely to get liver cancer or cirrhosis or Alzheimer's or most of the other long-term chronic diseases of aging. Um, there's hardly... Uh, is a good thing that you know we face uh, all these um, assaults on our bodies through aging, but it's uh, in some ways a privilege to die of Alzheimer's disease because it it shows that you have succeeded in not dying uh, in infancy, not dying in childhood, not being murdered as a young man, and that's where uh, you know if you had the choice to be born white or black in America without knowing anything else about this world. Um, you would definitely want to choose to be white, even though it would give you a elevated chance of committing suicide, of having Alzheimer's disease, of having liver disease, because what it would also buy you is a much lower chance of dying in infancy um, and dying young. Hmm. So that, that's the sort of paradox of <laughs> yeah. health. We're, we're speaking with Philip Longman, senior editor of the Washington Monthly, a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, and teaches health care policy at Johns Hopkins University. Wouldn't it be true that an African-American or an immigrant Latino who survives the vicissitudes of early poverty and poor medical care would be stronger and in better shape later in life? 
Uh, well, there's some suggestion in the life tables that that's true. So an 85-year-old black man actually has a higher life expectancy than an 85-year-old white man for whatever reasons. And But it's probably because if you manage to survive all the assaults <laughs> um, to life expectancy um, that a typical black man in the United States has to survive, uh, and, and you're su successful at that to the point that you live to be 85, you're probably a pretty strong dude. Um, yeah. <laughs> you've got a strong constitution. <laughs> and so that's my interpretation of that particular data point, but um, God knows why it, it may ultimately be true. And so that the develop the tougher skin, and that's uh, that's, that's very right. interesting where yeah. these, these things that come out from, from these types of studies. Uh, how much of this disparity is caused simply by homicide and other crimes? Uh, well, um, there's good news and bad news on homicide. Uh, I mean, the rates of homicide are, are way down um, for all races, um, but there's still, uh, that is way down compared to, say, the 1970s. Um, but they are still way much higher uh, for young black males. Um, and so uh, homicide is a leading cause of death for young black males. And it is definitely part of the story about uh, why there's this disparity in life expectancy. How much of the difference in health care can be explained by race? I mean, do blacks in America get worse medical care than whites, even if they have access to the same doctors and facilities? Um, well... <laughs> The first part of that question is yes, the second part is no, right? The blacks as a whole in the United States get worse access to health care, um, but it's largely because where African Americans live. They happen to live in places that have poor health, poor quality of health care. But it's simultaneously true that white folks and everybody else who lives in those places also gets crappy health care. Mm. So, right. Um, so it's, you know, perhaps a, a, a legacy of historical racism, why Americans live in the different places they do. But um, the fact that they do live in these places and that those places happen to have crappy health care um, in the case of where African-Americans live um, is is important. Um and by the way, you know, the image people might have in mind is, oh, that, he's talking about people living in inner cities that have to go to some St. Elsewhere hospital. But the quality data on, on health care tells us that it's actually not the, the, the St. Elsewhere community college, or, sorry, community uh, hospitals that have the worst health care. It's, it's often the the, the very prestigious um, academic medical centers that are typically uh, in big cities, um, places that, um, you know, for historical reasons are in Boston, in New York, in Washington, you know, that have a lot of um, very prestigious doctors in them, but they have really bad results. You know, that just throws another wrench into <laughs> what, what people might otherwise think about about. Uh, health care. I, I find that to be pretty fascinating that that would be the case. Well, this is one of those realms where you just have to check your ideology at the door. You know, we have to check your preconceived notions. It's a real Alice in Wonderland kind of world uh, where up is down and down is up. But, hmm. uh, uh, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that has emerged from the health care quality data of the last uh, 10, 15 years is that there's a, 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 at least a weak inverse relationship between the reputation of hospitals and their actual quality. So the, 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 the best ranked hospitals, according to U.S. News and World Report or whatever, you know, are actually um, more often than not the worst hospitals um, in terms of their mortality, patient satisfaction, uh, hospital infection, things like that. Um, is health and longevity simply then a matter of how much money you have, or maybe not here, or, or a matter of how much disparity there is in your community? You cite the example of white males living in Mississippi and in Minnesota. Right. Well, that's that's an interesting thought experiment. So, you know, suppose before you were born, 
you were told you had to be born a white man um, and you had your choice uh, to live out your days in Mississippi or Minnesota, right? If, if, you, if you chose Mississippi, your life expectancy would be dramatically lower than if you chose uh, Minnesota. And so why is that, <laughs> right? Well, once again, there's this, this tremendous difference between those two states and their level of inequality um, and social stratification. So Minnesota is the place where Harrison Keeler, or Garrison Keillor, you know, famously said, you know, all the kids in Lake Wobegon are above average. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a real sense, that's true in that Minnesota has very little um, income inequality. Um, it, its social style is more equal. So it's, it's, a, it's the kind of place where people don't brag about how their kids are above average and, and where invidious distinction is kind of frowned on. Mississippi, by contrast, is the place where that has the highest um, disparities of income, um, including uh, disparities between middle-class people and rich people. And it's also been getting worse in Mississippi more quickly than it has been uh, for the country as a whole. And, you know, perhaps this is what explains why white people in these two states live such different um, lengths of life. Um, because it's hard to come up with any other explanation. After all, most of these white folks in both states are, are not poor. And they're not um, lacking for basic shelter and food, right? And yet you have this tremendous disparity in how long they live, hmm. um, which, you know, again, pointing to inequality itself, inequality of income, inequality of social status, as being a, a powerful determinant of health. We're speaking with Philip Longman, senior editor of the Washington Monthly, a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, also teaches healthcare policy at Johns Hopkins University. Philip, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Take care. And huh, this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Democratic National Committee Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Guess that Congressman John Yarmuth, just in studio, uh, told us uh, Congress, which uh, roared back into town on Monday to take a big vote authorizing, um, or not, a military strike against Syria, leaves town today, never having to take that vote because the president has uh, given time to pursue this diplomatic approach of uh, Syria surrendering its chemical weapons. Where do we stand now? We're joined by a good friend of the program, a uh, member of Congress from Florida, Congresswoman Deborah Wasserman Schultz, who is also chair of the Democratic National Committee, uh, wearing at least two hats. She's also a great <laughs> mom, so a third hat as well. I don't know how many more. Hey, Congresswoman, how are you? Great, Bill. It's great to be with you again. Good to be with you. It was nice to see you uh, the other evening uh, as well at the uh, yes. at the Crossfire relaunch. You and I yes. uh, had some good times <laughs> together on Crossfire, right? We did. We did uh, you know, uh, several times actually during the the Florida recount and uh, yeah. and a couple times after that. It was uh, that it was uh, really excited about the relaunch of that show. What, yeah, you were a, a, a state senator from Florida in the recount. I yeah. remember that's how we met uh, online uh, on Crossfire. So. <laughs> Congresswoman, let me ask you, did the president do the right thing in uh, in asking Congress to vote on this, number one, and then do the right thing by saying, OK, um, now that you're back, we don't need your vote right now? Well, I think there's no question that the president did the right thing by seeking Congress's authorization to uh, you know, engage in a limited military strike against Syria, um, as, most especially because, you know, there is a hundred year old norm against uh, using chemical weapons. And 
that they are not only not a legitimate weapon of war, but, I mean, this is a, a leader who murdered almost 1,500 of his people in cold blood, uh, including hundreds of children. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, Bill, the, the images of those kids writhing on the floor or, and lined up dead, murdered by their president, it, it, it's just something that should be abhorrent to the entire world, and if the world's uh, really only remaining superpower, uh, a united front from the United States, the president's uh, conviction backed up by Congress's authorization, would help make sure we could degrade and deter his ability to do it again. And then to pull back uh, what was also the right thing, because if there's an opportunity to make sure we can uh, you know, bring about the end of the use of those weapons in Syria, uh, then... That, 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 that's a political solution that President Obama has always said he, uh, he prefers. So how were you, uh, when you came back, how were you inclined, if there had been a vote, how were you inclined to vote? I, I, was, I planned to vote yes, and, uh, and, and, and still believe that, uh, that we need to leave that, that authorization, uh, and uh, that we need to vote, and that the authorization uh, and, uh, and the president's threat needs to remain in place because that is the only reason <laughs> that Syria and Russia came to the table and suggested mm-hmm. that, uh, that they would be willing to put their chemical weapons, uh, serious chemical weapons, under international control. And without that threat, uh, no one should, should believe that, that, that we would be in the place where we even had a, an opportunity to negotiate the securing of those chemical weapons. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, as recently as last Sunday, they were still denying they had any chemical weapons. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. Now it's been acknowledged by both by both Putin and Assad that uh, that they were used. Uh, you know, it, it's. It, but at the end of the day, look, it, I'm glad that there is a potential for a, uh, a a solution here that that would not have us strike, but. Um, you know, make no mistake, there, there's, uh, there's got to be a short window here and one in which we verify then trust. Right. No, you were, you were, you're getting exactly to my next question, because a lot of this depends on trusting Putin and trusting Assad. I mean, how can we? <laughs> right. Well, I, I think that the, the opportunity has to be explored. I mean, that there have been overtures made by uh, by Mr. Putin, which uh, Secretary Kerry is uh, is, is taking uh, you know, is taking advantage of through President Obama's direction. You know, we'll see what can be negotiated in Geneva when when Secretary Kerry arrives there today, and uh, and and that the United Nations will uh, will hopefully rally around. I mean, making sure that we have a you know a really ironclad verification system, one that ensures that we know. That those chemical weapons were were removed from Assad's control. That he's not able to use them would accomplish that. That would, would accomplish that goal. That the limited strike would have, uh, and and obviously that that would be preferable. But the strike has to remain a credible threat, and they have to believe that we will use it if they don't proceed uh, at it with all deliberate speed. How much time do you think we can give this, Congresswoman? You know, it's hard to put a time a time frame on it. it, it the, there's got to be. Clearly, yeah, I think you said earlier there's got to be some limit, though, right? I mean, you can't, just can't just drag mind. on forever and ever, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, but but clearly there's some complexity in establishing a process yeah. to secure those weapons and then verify that, uh, that that they've been removed from his control completely. Yes. Uh, how does this uh, in in the end? Uh, how do you think this plays out? Let, let's say this this. Uh, and there's a lot of skepticism <laughs> well, in all of us because of the players involved of course, uh, right. that this could I work out. So. But let's 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 be positive and say it works out and they, we get those chemical weapons and they're under international control. Uh, so how does this play out? Does that weaken uh, Assad in the end or strengthen him? Because our ultimate goal is to get rid of this guy. Well, without chemical weapons, I mean, he clearly used those chemical weapons uh, to try to clear out opposition in the Damascus suburbs uh, that he that he that his forces were not able to do without using abhorrent weapons. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it, it was a clear sign of weakness uh, that, that Assad used them, and so we need to continue. Uh, first, first option always to use diplomatic and political tools to try to defuse this conflict and, and, and get Assad out of power. Um, and we are providing limited support to the, to the rebels. But again, that's fraught with, uh, with complexity as well, because uh, 
some of them are, are, are not are not our friends, nor would we want them running a country. So uh, I think we have to proceed carefully and and not you know it's not our job to engage in in another nation's civil war. And and I know that's certainly not President Obama's intention. Congressman Deborah Wasserman Schultz, our guest here on the Bill Press Show this Thursday morning. I want to ask you to put your other hat on, if you can, please, Congresswoman, for just a second sure. here. How does the uh, let's take a look at the uh, political landscape today? First, people are they think this is a year off, and it, it is right. But there are a couple of important races for uh, governor's race in Virginia, governor's race uh, in New Jersey, mayor's race in New York, uh, and then all everything's up next year all over right. again. Right. Uh, how do you feel now uh, in your position as Democratic National Chair about? Uh, Democratic, uh, the strength of the party. Really, really good. I mean, we are really continuing to focus on map expansion and and continuing to celebrate the uh, the successes of Democratic victories. I mean, we 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 look at 2013 and see that uh, the continued uh, turning blue of the state of Virginia with Terry McAuliffe, who is uh, who is in really strong shape to be elected governor. It's got a, a you know really incredible. You know our, our uh, former DNC chair, uh, mm-hmm. but but a, a yeah. really strong, incredible business, incredibly savvy businessman in his own right, who you know, is focused on job creation, focused on making sure that we can continue to revitalize the middle class. And the polling shows that uh, that that to Terry's numbers are really strong, and that Virginia's Virginians are poised to elect him governor of the Commonwealth, particularly because uh, his opposition is a Tea Party extremist who is also wildly unethical and has been caught up in uh, some pretty disturbing uh, mm-hmm. disturbing financial and gift scandal. Um, look at uh, what's going on in New York. Uh, we're very likely to elect the first Democratic mayor of, uh, of New York City in 20 years. So, yes, New York is blue, but New York City hasn't had a Democratic mayor in 20 right. years. We... Uh, we are focused on expanding the map. We're a national party, while the Republicans remain mired in insular civil war. Uh, they're a regional party. Uh, we're focused on Arizona, on Texas, on Georgia. Let me just point out, Bill, Georgia, in, in Georgia, where we put no resources in the 2012 presidential election, mm-hmm. President Obama got 45 percent of the vote. That's with us putting no resources in, yeah. and our volunteer base going to North Carolina. You know, sending our volunteer base to North Carolina and Florida. So we know that we have opportunities there with with some investment. And uh, at the Democratic Party, we're going to be working to make sure that we continue to expand the map. Oh man, if we could, if we could turn Georgia, uh, it looks like it's already get, becoming a little purple. We could turn Georgia blue, man. That 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 really would be his story. That would turn some heads, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> you got it. Uh, be a proud feather in your cap, indeed, Congresswoman. <laughs> always good to have you with us. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Thanks, Bill. All right, Take have care. A great weekend, Congresswoman Deborah Chair. Deborah Wasserman Schultz. That's all for America's Democrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. James Galbraith, Philip Longman, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to America's Democrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to com.